How, what would, how would you prefer? That they were unsafe due to okay. age and condition and were remove, removed okay. and need to be replaced. Okay. Any other comments? No? Okay. Then I will make a motion to approve the minutes from our March 21st, 2018 with the amendment as suggested by Lisa. Second. Thank you. Seconded by Jeff. Um, <coughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's? Okay. So then I think we can move on to item four, design review applications. We're a little ahead of time. If we turn to application DR18-04, is there anybody in the audience who's here to speak to that? No. You, you can, or that's why you're here. More than willing to speak to that. Okay. I'm not sure the number, but is that 1056 Falls Road? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's me. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so then let's turn to design review application DR18-04, which is, um, let's see, okay, let's turn to this first. So it's a uh, design review application. The applicant proposes to replace a single family home with a new single family home located at 1056 Falls Road. Okay, so then, Mr. Gardner, if you can step forward, please. I have to swear you in, so if you could hold up your right hand and affirm that any evidence that you're about to give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Okay. So what can you tell us about this application? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you. Uh, there are probably some members of the board who have seen this application already um, some months ago. It was presented and approved. Um, and in the process of uh, trying to find somebody to buy this house that was presented and approved, uh, I received a number of recommendations on how to make the house look better and function better uh, as a residence uh, with the layout of the rooms and so forth. Um, so we did some architectural work, and basically what we think is that we've improved how the building looks. Um, we did meet with our historic consultant, and um, his letter is part of the package there. Um, <coughs> we have been in front of the Historic Design Review Board, and uh, they made a couple of suggestions which were included in this, you know, the final design that's in front of you today. Um, your staff has gone through the drawings, and uh, I don't see anybody here from staff, but uh, okay. Uh, well, I think it'd be important for the staff to mention if indeed these drawings do match the recommendations that were made by the Historic Design Review Board. Okay. Caitlin, did you have any comments? I didn't have any comments. Um, and as far as I know, they match up to what the recommendations were. Dean actually reviewed these applications, though. But I don't have any comments from him, so it should be good. Okay. So if we make a motion to approve, do I have to read in those three conditions from the Historic Preservation and Design Review Commission or not? <laughs> I would. Okay. 
just for the record and just so the building permits reflect that when we just to get those. Okay. And uh, does anybody on the board have any questions? Here though, but the um, the footprint will remain the same from what we approved before, yeah, the the same. Yeah. and the square footage roughly the, the same. The square footage remains the same. Okay. Right. Actually, a little smaller than the square okay. in terms of the floor space. Okay. 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 So then I will make a motion to grant design. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Public sorry. Anybody else in the public? You can see that. Does anybody else have any comments to make on the application? <coughs> no. Okay. Then now I will make a motion. <laughs> I have to read it. I will make a motion to grant design review approval to Scott Gardner for a replacement single family home and detached garage at 1056 Falls Road, as depicted on the elevations received March 29, 2018. The windows will be aluminum clad with true simulated divided light in two over two pattern patterning. The second story window on the south elevation will be centered and the soffit overhang will be a minimum of 12, in 12 inches. Per their approval, the recommendations of the Historic Preservation and Design Review Commission. Further, a zoning permit will be required prior to the commencement of construction. That, that's my motion. Can I have a second? I second that. Seconded by Lisa. Well, I, I don't know who was working. Oh. You can Lisa, have the Lisa. Is Lisa, Lisa. All right. yeah. I think she has me she out. There. Seconded by Lisa. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. okay, motion carried. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. The next item on our agenda is design review application DR 18 06. Is there anybody in the audience who is here to speak to that application? No? Does anybody on the board have any comments or discussion? I had a question, but it's it doesn't really impact yeah. my thoughts. I was just curious about the sponsor panel on the scoreboard and whether or not that rotates or changes or if it's set as whatever it's going to be. Right. But that know. doesn't I really imagine. impact. Yeah, I didn't see anything in the packet that addressed that. No. Kate, do you know? I didn't, I didn't hear that. What was that? Whether or not the sponsor panel rotates or changes or if whatever is put there stays there. I think those are the accurate sponsors, and I don't, I don't believe they they rotate. The ones that were approved before have been there since the sign was installed, so it should stay um, Burton and Marches. Granite design review approval to the town of Shelburne and Shelburne Little League for the replacement of a scoreboard at 5420 Shelburne Road with the following conditions. The scoreboard <clears throat> will be brick red in color. The existing posts will be utilized. Uh, and three, a zoning permit shall be required prior to the installation of the new scoreboard. I'll second that motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Don't forget to come get me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Moving on to item five on the agenda, which is application VCP 18-03. Still a little ahead of time. This is an application by Civil Engineering Associates on behalf of Colleen and Joseph Brandon 
seeking approval of a setback cutting plan for the removal of vegetation within the forest management area as conditioned by SUB 05-05R2. The property at 500 Lands End Lane is located in the Rural District, Lakeshore Overlay District and Flood Plain and Watercourse Overlay District. Is there anybody in the audience who's here to tell us about this? Yes. Two people, Two okay. Up. Okay, so if you could both stand then, I will swear you both in if you're both going to give testimony. Raise your right hands and please swear or affirm that the evidence that you are going to give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. You probably have to, you know, we have to hear you actually. I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> okay, so then. Can I just say one thing? Yes. Mary Ann's taken the minutes from yes, the case, so we got to be really careful about Who's telling her who makes motions and who seconds yes. and so forth. And okay. she's yes. going to be relying on the microphone to do the minutes. So, yeah. So, so whoever's going to speak first, come to the microphone and say who you are, and then well, Mary Ann can hear you. Project. My name's Jack Milbank. I'm from Civil Engineering Associates, mm -hmm. and I've been working with uh, Colleen Brandon and uh, an arborist named Bill DeVos, who um, is not here tonight, but um, did provide some um, professional assistance in evaluating um, some dead, diseased, and damaged trees that we would like to uh, remove at the Brandon property, which is a lot three of the Jackson subdivision. This is uh, for some of you who um, aren't familiar with Shelburne Point. It was a subdivision that um, uh, a family started in around the year 2000 and was completed somewhere in the, uh, um, through the subdivision process in approximately 2006 or, or maybe 2005. We don't know the exact date it was finished. But as part of the, uh, it was a significant uh, piece of property. Um, environmentally there's a lot of natural sp communities out there that um, it's a very special piece of property so as part of the uh, conditions of approval and with a, uh, a management plan um, there was a uh, setback um, zone which is 100 feet from elevation 102 that um, was going to require uh, planning commission approval for removal of uh, dead, diseased, and compromised trees within um, designated forestry management areas. Part of this simple condition was that prior to the issuing of a building permit, an applicant or a landowner, as part of the permit application or prior to the permit application, was supposed to file a, f a plan that designated, uh, pres there were prescriptive requirements for lengths and uh, um, um, areas of, of view management zones and forestry management zones. And so in this particular project, <clears throat> um, somehow, this is the first lot that was uh, developed, somehow that got overlooked. So as part of this process, we worked with Caitlin. Caitlin and I spent a lot of time researching, uh, looking for might have, what might have happened but uh, it, this, this plan was absent. So uh, the plan you see on the wall was approved by Caitlin. We, we came in, we worked with Bill DeVos and Colleen, and uh, we recreated what was started. The, the process had been started, it just was never submitted, or if it was submitted, there's no record of it. So um, we have the view management areas and the forestry management areas identified on our setback cutting plan. We uh, inventoried the uh, view management areas uh, with two different ways. We have the basal area of the, the trees in the, in the zone. We also, uh, supplementally, we had to do an inventory reduction plan, just a straight count. Unfortunately, when I looked at what Caitlin put up on the website, the inventory reduction plan isn't part of your package, or neither were the photographs that were used as supporting uh, 
evidence for the um, <clears throat> proposed cutting of the dead disease and damaged trees. They were submit. Um, we do have a permit. We did get a permit for the view management areas. We have a vegetative <coughs> cutting permit for that, but in the forestry management area, it requires putting our proposal in front of you if we cut more than three dead, diseased, or damaged trees. We have to come back to the Planning Commission, which is now the Development Review Board, and um, I'll say convince you that the removal of these trees isn't going to impact uh, the views, um, the view protection, and, the, um, and that it's actually um, in the best interest of uh, the stability of the top of the, the, uh, the bank uh, in terms of uh, multi-generational growth uh, that, that uh, we, sh we can cut these and that we don't need to really do any replanting. So that's why we're here tonight. We're here to ask your permission in the three zones, that, three forestry management areas, to cut approximately 30 dead, diseased, and damaged trees so that we can actually uh, <clears throat> manage and uh, enhance the forestry areas and protect the trees that are damaged that are falling off the top of the, the bank. Um, so I don't think you got photographs. So I don't, I, I only printed a couple packages just so you can see the type of, what you did get photographs of, yeah. you got three photographs of each of the zones taken from the, the, the house with the azimuths. So we have, um, and I'm just, I'm just gonna step over here for a minute. You want me to take that with me? Yep. It's usually a second. So I don't remember the exact frontage they have. If it's uh, um, 1,100 feet of lakeshore, it's somewhere. But we have a view um, starting from north to south. We have a forestry management zone, a view management zone, a forestry uh, view management. Oh, I can't see my own. I can't see the screen. So, oh, in the uh, view management. Oh, I see what she's done. She's trimmed the bottom of the plant off. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, Jack. That's just a function of the screen at the moment. Oh, oh, okay. I was missing a zone. Now I see it. It's cut off. So anyway, it goes uh, forestry, view, forestry, view, forestry, view. Yeah. And those meet the prescriptive requirements. But what we're proposing is to remove some trees in each one of these that are like I said, dead, disease, and damage. So your photographs that you got represent the, the view from the house through the forestry management zones. And they're, they're there to show the density of the cedar and the sh to show that really that from a visual and a screening aspect, the removal of some of these trees is, isn't gonna impact views at all. Um, I'm gonna give you guys to pass around just some photographs of the, uh, these are stapled together. I'll put one at each end of the table. These are the types of trees that we're talking about. That This is an inventory reduction table for each zone. And I'll pop one over here for you guys. I don't trip on all this stuff. So these are, so, so you can see what's going on. Uh, my other table's gone, I'll get it. Anyway, I, I thought those were going to be uploaded, so I apologize, or downloaded, whatever you do. Let me grab another one. So you're asking that these be What we're asking for in is in each one of these zones on the inventory reduction table, which are also depicted on the the little table on the left hand side that we have permission based on uh, Bill DeVos of Tree Works. He's an arborist and a horticulturist, and yeah, he and my site walk. Um, we, we're asking permission to remove these trees without having to replant. We truthfully feel that 
And when we release this, we're going to get light. We're going to get uh, um, allow the revegetation to, re to occur naturally. It's dark along the top of the bank. We're going to the few trees that we are getting rid of are a lot of them are horizontal. They're actually perpendicular to the bank right now, or they, the other the, the damaged trees are in danger of pulling over the and creating slips along the top, but that light will allow revegetation to occur naturally. Okay. Okay, so you provided us a specific, the, is this a repeat of what we already had? That is not, I, well, you no. know, I didn't see it. When I went to the website that uh, Caitlin had the, to this. Okay. Yeah. Those numbers represent, uh, that's a, a reduction as, as a percentage. And um, basically what happens is if it went b below a 50% reduction, then you're, you, you could require a, a replanting one-to-one. -one. Okay. But we're showing how minimal, this is truthfully a minimal uh, removal, and it's really designed to, to prevent uh, well, first of all, it's designed to get rid of some unsaid dead trees that are leaning. And, uh, and uh, you know, it seems like it should be a no-brainer to cut some of those, but the requirement, uh, you know, it's, it's, this, is, this is a... I think if you, if you aggregate all those percentages together, we're talking about an average of less than 10% of the vegetation? Or yes, oh, oh way less. Less than 5%. Yeah, because it's 89, 89, 99. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you... Not this all out. That's pretty. That's the. Yeah. That's the supplement with the percentages. Hey, Caitlin, I have a question for you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. You're done. No, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is really then starting to establish the baseline for this for this property on their tree inventory. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So, so I mean, the trouble, I guess, with the application in a way, and not to their fault, um, is that, you know, first we'd like to establish a baseline before there's any development on the property, which is why I think there is a condition um, to get this done beforehand. But yeah, this would be functioning as the baseline. So, um, yes. So, if someone comes in five years from now or three years from now and they want to cut trees within the view management zone now the 75 and 50 percent rules start to apply based upon this inventory is that correct right yeah so it won't be kind of like a rolling like once they remove like let's say 10 trees it won't restart if somebody comes in in five years and says hey i'd like to remove trees from there and start from right you know okay the number after removal so yes this will be the baseline for all cutting applications in the future okay. and this is um more focused on the forest management areas that's why it's in front of you the management areas they're allowed to cut trees kind of um, a lot more easily than they can in the forest management areas just uh for the conditions of approval which are in your packet in the form of an email and staff report Okay, I'm, I'm seeing both the fours. Okay, I have no issues at all with cutting down dead trees and stuff. That's fine. I more want to make sure that the proper baseline is established going forward on what the inventory is. And I'm looking at the print, and there's like three view management areas, which is really good. It identifies trees and all that other good stuff about them. Yeah, okay. Right, yeah, so this plan is identifying the different management areas and meets all of the requirements as far as the width of those management areas and the two other the nuances that were part of the original um, subdivision application in terms of the forest management. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Caitlin, so then I have a question as well. Um, okay. Mr. Milbank just said that they're removing so few trees that they would say that um, they so they don't need to replace any of them. But I do see that you did make a note in the information that you provided to us that we should maybe address existing the existing density of the trees and whether we should require any new plantings. Yeah, 
Right, so that's a discretion item. So there's no trigger for, you know, if they, well, there actually is, but we're not quite there yet, um, trigger for when they need to plant. Um, so I think the photos will probably tell you the most, more than the plans will, as far as the density there. Um, uh, yeah, and there are a few, you know, cedars and whatnot that, you know, even dead or disease are dying. Um, probably provide quite a lot of cover. So, um, yeah, I don't want you to just um, not feel like you, you can ask for more plantings. I mean, it doesn't have to be extensive, but I also have an email from today from the Natural Resources um, Committee asking that we kind of thoroughly look over this. And their request actually was that you have a forest ecologist take a site walk out there um, as well. Um, they don't, they aren't required to provide a letter. This was just kind of them reaching out. Um, and Bill DeVos is a certified arborist or licensed arborist, I believe. So, um, but just going back to, yeah, I pointed out in the staff report, it's completely your discretion. They're not removing on a percentage based, you know, um, number a lot of trees, but um, there's also a heavy, um, not an importance placed on just maintaining that screening as much as possible. So if you did feel like you wanted to add a few more trees in there, that's completely within okay. that, the right but, to do so. The, Caitlin, the quality of your... Slow down. Yeah, the way, I'm really, I'm struggling. Uh, <laughs> struggling to follow Hang on one you. second. Can you, uh, do you have, excuse me, do you have the mic turned on on those speakers? Yeah. Can you try turning that off? Because I think it's, 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 it's. That would not be helping. Or turn it down, maybe way down, because I think it's reverberating. Try it again, Kate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Can you just tell me so, about the the request from the? Um, so the request NRC. from NRC. the Natural Resources Committee was that you consider. Um, having a qualified forest ecologist take a site walk out there and just kind of go over what's proposed to you and maybe do a site walk yourselves just to get an idea of the density out there, um, which I think you can get, you know, a general grasp of it from the photographs, but that was a request made by the Natural Resources Committee. And I believe one of the other properties on the point this same kind of thing happened. I think the Natural Resources Committee and somebody from the DOD or maybe from the Planning and Zoning Office went out there uh, just to get a better idea of it. That's not a requirement, but if it would help you in deciding if you like to see replantings, you certainly could do that. Was that better? Okay. Okay. So, so they're, yeah, they're dead trees or damaged trees, as depicted and identified. Correct. No selecting or cutting of healthy trees. That's right. Not right. Management zones. Right. Okay. And so then there's a question of you guys would prefer not to replant. And well, I we're not. We're just saying that basically with Bill, it's arborist, and yeah. um, and basically based on. I'm going to share something else with you after this, but um, based on the fact that a lot of those trees, you know, the, the replanting is for view protection. Right. If you read the, uh, right. I don't know, I think you have that. We really feeling like that um, with the way, the judicious way that Colleen has directed uh, the cutting of the view management areas. There mm -hmm. are no cutting. Like unlike a couple of the other or one specific property at the mm -hmm. end of the point, a lot of these trees were not cut. They were topped. They were still there. They were there to protect the I mean it, there's a real sensitivity and a stewardship um, associated with the management of this particular eleven hundred feet of Shelburne Point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to tell you that I brought out our um, permit analyst from the Agency of Natural Resources who works in the Shoreland Protection Act. And uh, I went over this with her last summer. Uh, 
when we were also she put, reviewing the stabilization <coughs> project, and uh, she felt that this is one of the n nicest pieces of lakeshore she's seen, and in her um, and as nicely managed as any lakeshore she's seen in in the state. And uh, as a matter of fact, it uh, and this is a matter of fact, Colleen was absent. Her daughter was present, but there's an award people can apply for, and it's called the Lakewise Award. And uh, there's no interest in that, but it was offered. She, she felt that strongly about the, the property. Mm -hmm. So when Bill and I walked this, um, um, we really, these trees that we're showing to you, some of them, even though they have exposed roots, aren't the dead, diseased, and damaged trees that are shown on the inventory, but the trees that are jeopardized from the damage standpoint. I mean, the dead trees are the dead trees. So you can see examples of those. But the, the damaged trees that are really um, threatening the stability of the top of the bank mm -hmm. are the trees that are perpendicular. So you might see two trees in one photograph, and the only one that's going to be removed is the, the one that's um, perpendicular, or not quite, mm -hmm. but the sloping trees. Okay. So we really feel there's plenty of canopy there from okay. the aspect that we're protecting and the views from the lake. And likewise, I'm sure the Brandons don't need to see everybody bombing by Shelburne Point either. And so protection of the view is really... Um, if, if you read the, if you, if you read the, actually the truth of the matter is, if you read the forestry management, if you read the decision for the Jackson subdivision. If I could comment on that, I've gone kind of back and forth from Mrs. Boss's letter, because um, I'm looking for him as kind of the expert mm -hmm. testimony here on this compared to the requirements, and uh, I, I certainly wish he'd actually use the same words that we have in here so you could say yep absolutely does meet it but i think by as he closes he says that this has been done judiciously and with minimal if any alterations to the shoreline aesthetics so i think it's probably compatible with if you look at the um, requirements of the forest and management zone um, items one and two and it talks about you know basically you have to be able to remove the vegetation without compromising the coverage or whatever so i'm saying he's got He's essentially used equivalent words, in my opinion. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, if that wouldn't suffice, and it, it does, in my opinion, then I'd have to go look at it. But okay. it's, it does suffice, in your opinion. It, it does. And I do have to say, I commend the person that did all the hard work of going around and inventorying every tree. When I read this last night, I was like, wow, that's a lot of work. Well, it is interesting because the reality is the basal, that's an inventory of the trees. The, the trees that you're looking at, the big inventory, that's just, that's, we're not even here talk. that's the view management areas. You know, that's typical of the forestry management areas too. And that's why it was important for Caitlin and, or to have the inventory reduction table. We did account yep. we did actually that was just a count so we could demonstrate as a percentage under your normal lakeshore uh, overlay district basal area or you're allowed to reduce by basal area so that's displayed it, it's yep. okay so you handed us some additional photographs that were not in the packet well I, I didn't they're they're in the application so just so the history uh, this how this developed Caitlin and I worked on this with Bill we worked on then the inventorying to, to, in support of this setback cutting plan. Then we applied for the vegetative cutting permit for the dead, diseased, and damaged trees in the yeah. view management areas where mm -hmm. this, those photographs, they were submitted with, with this whole sort of package. Right. Then we had to submit to the DRB an application for the, view, the forestry management areas. And, and in all fairness, it just didn't get... It, They've been here. It just didn't get put in in the download right. that was. Okay. Well, I just want to be clear that that we have oh, they're in the. Okay. So then we don't need to be concerned about mentioning them. Okay. So they're in there. They're in evidence already, essentially. I guess that's what I'm concerned about, and the the list as well. Yes. Okay. All right. So 
then I guess I'd be interested to know what the feelings of other DRB members. I mean, it sounds as if, um, David, you're I'm, happy with... I'm, I'm good with what I see here. Them. Okay. Yeah. Um, regard I to mean, Mr. DeVos, Mr. Bill DeVos is probably one of the more recognized arborists yeah. on the East Coast and, then, okay. and, and beyond. Um, so I... I put a lot of weight on his analysis, and I agree with um, <clears throat> David that um, his closing comment um, carries a lot of weight for me. And I, based on the photographs and the number, and then looking at the numbers, that they've done a pretty darn good job of minimizing the impact on um, on the established um, trees in that area. So, um, and and I and I also think that. <clears throat> they're they're quite a ways from triggering the, the necessity for additional um, plantings to supplement what's there. Okay. And you don't see a need for any other for a site visit or going. The pictures, okay. the pictures are fine with me. Okay. We have somebody in the audience who would also like to comment. So stand up. Um, Thank you, did, Sean McFadden. I'm on the Natural Resources Committee, so I, I can elaborate on what I assume are uh, Gail Albert's comments about perhaps having an independent evaluation of the, the plan. Okay, um, so, sorry, your name was Sean? Sean McFadden. McFadden. M-A-C. F-A-D-E-N. So if you could raise your right hand and swear or affirm that any that the evidence that you're about to give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Thank you. So on other projects on Shelburne Point and elsewhere in town, there has been the, the, the issue of how forest management plans should be evaluated. And there are some different differing views on that. We would suggest that in a case like this where we're talking about a pretty sensitive site that it would be worthwhile to to have an independent ecologist review it the plan that has been developed by an arborist may may be spot on i think bill devos indeed has a, an excellent reputation but he's not a, a forest ecologist we, we would suggest that you need to we should consider the, the broader implications of forest management there. So it's not merely in trimming the trees, perhaps taking dead and dying out. It's also evaluating ultimately the effect on that lakeshore zone. So again, we, we think that it, it would be worthwhile to have an independent review of, of the plan and ultimately to, to have that, that extra opinion about, as you know, is a, is a very sensitive location in, in Shelburne. Okay. Okay. We appreciate the input. Thank you. And does the applicant have any comments in response? Well, I, <clears throat> I, I do, but it doesn't, from a zoning standpoint it doesn't um or how i guess based on the requirements or the conditions of approval for the jackson subdivision all i was going to comment on was that uh two lot the lot the first lot and the second lot with bill had a uh with there's no development on those lots at that particular point in time there's probably i'm gonna only guess i don't know um the, the total point is probably about a mile of shoreline Lots one and two probably are uh, add up to 1,500 feet of that. Um, well, they, they had a plan for removal of dead, disease, damaged trees. Um, but because there was no development on that lot, they didn't actually have to have a setback plan. And I was just going to comment that there was really no, there was no consideration at all there for replanting. And they moved, uh, removed a much higher percentage of the of the dead damage and diseased trees and that's only just that's just a topic of discussion so when the natural resources committee when that was here in front of the development review board I was just curious how you what what you guys thought or was was that put in front of you for 
comment. Are you aware of that? I, I was just curious. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. All I was asking is that I didn't know. Caitlin, did you, when, when you did the work with Jeff Jackson and Bill DeVos, and um, did, was there a, uh, did you have the um, uh, Natural Resources Committee, or did you have another uh, arborist or uh, independent forester take a look at that in terms of replanting? Are you talking about the amendment to the subdivision, or are you talking about a cutting application? The cutting application. I was just curious. Oh, that, that must have predated me. I haven't done one okay. for Jeff Jackson. OK. And if those are under, if these I was only asking as a curiosity okay. question, because, right. so, you know, they no. basically it was the same consultant, same thing, no, no requirement. And I don't think there's an issue with that. I mean, it's just it's a having someone come out, certainly, and take a look. And um, that's, that's not an issue. It's just that it's just, it's just it's time and it's time. money. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Yes. The Resources How long ago did you guys know about this plan? Wait. Be by the hand. Okay, so we, we've been following the various projects on Shelburne Point for, for many years, and this the, the issue of whether an arborist is, is adequate. I'm sorry, this plan. I'm talking about we, this application. This, we just learned about this the other day when the staff report came out. Okay, and how yeah, long? This Jeff, this is an, an application that under the um, Subdivision regulation of the bylaws automatically goes to natural resources. So they just kind of, like you said, learns about it when the staff report comes out and when it's posted to the porch forum. Okay. So this is kind of like a voluntary um, letter and comments, not something that's required. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's, that's the piece of one. So the resources committee doesn't have to weigh in on yay or nay, just has to advise and comment is that correct kate like historic preservation well, they tell us exactly yeah, what so, they want to have you know there are plenty of applications that you know involve natural resources that don't trigger the requirements that right. the natural okay. resources committee can weigh in on okay um but this isn't one of them where it is required okay all right thank you thank you well then we're purely advisory in, in any capacity so we, yeah. we have no no control over it. Okay. Thank you. Um, question for my colleagues, I guess. I um, apologize for being new here. Um, if, if an ecologist were to go out there, by what criteria would they evaluate what might or might not need to be done, and how would that interrelate with what is required for the forest management zone? Question. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get my arms around what a, a, a forest ecology ecologist would how they would comment on the projects. Um, I just. I'm, I'm. I'm trying to. I'm trying to create in my mind what they would evaluate, how they would evaluate it, under what criteria, and most of those. And really. There are no criteria that in this this decision that I read and that I know of that are we're really bound to to abide by. So, um. I, I guess my take is if we, we had such a strong endorsement from the arborist, and mm -hmm. if we didn't have that, I'd be right there with you on that. Um, but in, in my mind, you know, he covered you know some of the some of the critical items. There's a nice inventory, and it looks like there was a lot of due diligence done. If there wasn't, this would be a whole different discussion, because we, we saw what happens if we don't put that discipline into it. So I, I do appreciate and I do respect what you're saying, and I, I, I feel comfortable that due diligence was done, and I thank you for reminding us of that. <clears throat> okay. So no other comments from the board? No, nope, I think. Okay. So then, let's see if I can make a motion. Um, I will make a motion to finalize the record and close the hearing with an indication of approval. 
and direct staff to prepare a decision indicating approval of vegetation cutting plan VCP 18-02 as depicted on the application materials with the condition that a vegetation cutting permit shall be required prior to any improvements being made. Seconded, Seconded by Jeff. Um, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Any nays? Any discussion? I'll go with Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And thank you. Okay, we'll just pause and wait for the return of Jeff. And then we will take up item six on the agenda, which is application CU02-01R2. It's an application by John Pizzigali seeking conditional use approval for the reconstruction of a pre-existing non-conforming deck in the Lakeshore Overlay District. The property at 224 Pinehaven Shores Lane is located in the residential district, the stormwater overlay district, the lakeshore overlay district, and the floodplain and watercourse overlay district. Do we have anybody here to tell us about this application? Nobody. Okay. Um, Caitlin, yes, <laughs> it seemed as if you had a few comments. Um, Wait, okay, one, one moment, Caitlin, I don't know. Are you here to talk to uh, application, are you the pizza galley? Up? No, okay, sorry, Caitlin. Some people just came back in, I thought maybe it was them. Oh. <laughs> All right, we're listening, Let's talk slowly. Okay, I'll try. It's hard. New York kicks in. Um, so the application, like you said, is for a pre-existing non-conforming deck. He's basically proposing to reconstruct it and to enclose it. So there will be a roof overhang that does extend, looks like a little farther than the existing. Um, but you'll see a note in section 1920.2 that per the definition of setbacks, roof overhangs are exempt from setback requirements as long as it doesn't extend more than three feet. Um, there's also a patio area that's below that extends um, as far out as the proposed deck. So it's not triggering any of the red flags um, of extending farther into the setback than an already existing structure. So most of the comments in there are just kind of elaborating on that. Um, and you have uh, photos of that patio area that's below, as well as elevations and plans that pretty accurately um, show what he's proposing. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with this application, but I'm happy to take any questions. So one of the things that you addressed in here was um, uh, DRB should request the total area of the existing and proposed decks. But then um, on the top of the next page, it appears that um, that was provided. Is that correct? Can you just point me to what page I'm sorry, and what section? Um, the bottom of page three, um, 1750.2A and B. 1750.2B. A and B. A. I, I mean, I just, could you confirm that that has not been provided, right? 
Right. So okay. he's indicated it will be the same total area, but hasn't provided the exact numbers. Okay. So I um, think that should probably be added as a condition of approval just to button that up. And then um, you'll also see under E that the exact heights were given. So um, just based on the roof pitch, there's depending on the roof pitch, the height requirements are different. So I would also recommend that as a condition of approval. Um, I don't really have a concern about the height. I'm just, again, just buttoning it up. Well, similarly with F, did you have concerns about the materials and the colors since there is no information about that? So should that be a condition as well? We certainly could. Um, I'm imagining it will be the same as the existing. It doesn't have an application in to change anything else on the house. Um, but yes, I think it would be a good move to have that as another condition. So what can you, Lisa, which section was that? Um, that is um, F on page four. So it's 1750.2 F. Yeah. Okay. So some sort of limitation uh, that it should, the new structure should what be the same? Should be generally compatible with the existing materials and colors. Okay. Is that? Yeah. Question, Kate. Um, on page three, 1920.2i uh, uh, talks about kind of the definition of not not more non-conforming, and um, it talks about that the square footage essentially can't change from my read into this. But when I look at the site plan, there's a table there that lists square footages, and when I total things up, the square footage got greater. Uh, in the proposed versus existing. So I'm curious, where did that square footage come from? Sorry, I lost the last bit of that. What was that? Um, on the site plan, on lot data, that table that, that identifies existing uh, square footages compared to proposed, and there's a shift between the house square footages and the deck, and I can understand that, but the total square footages, when you add up the columns, it's more when it comes to promote to, on the proposed versus the existing. So are we growing square footage into the non-conforming area that we're not supposed to be doing according to this article? So that goes back to that um, deck that's under the, under the exist, uh, that patio area that's under the existing deck. So for our regulations, that, that patio area is considered to be a structure. And so um, my read of nonconformities is as long as that total area, so the area that, that we also include in that patio and how far out that goes, as long as it doesn't go past that, it can be approved. But I do see what you're saying. I would also say, though, that this looks like site data that might have more. Yeah. Oh, just kidding. I'm going to take that back. Anyway, yeah, the patio area it extends farther than the existing deck. And so um, it's a non conforming structure, but it won't, um, the degree of non conformity while the deck um, is growing in area won't be getting any closer than the most non-conforming structure on that lot, which is the patio. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, un I understand that, but <laughs> okay. some, something got bigger when I add up the square footage, so where where is that? Yeah, yeah because, it's, because it's closed it's in. Right, but I understand that gets bigger, the deck gets smaller, but if you add in the t total them up, the columns, right. Right. do your Excel spreadsheet, right. existing bottom line is 2,322 square feet, proposes 2,373 square feet. It's like 50 square feet, but it got bigger, the right? Rules the rules are the rules. Right. Right. But it's a, you're saying, if I get your argument here, it's... It's a it's an expansion within the existing nonconformity. 
Is that correct? That was beautifully summed up. Yes, Mark. <laughs> Because the, under the patio underneath is the greatest extent of the current nonconformity. Right. Which we're considering right. an, encro an, an encroachment yeah. and a nonconformity. Oh. I, yeah, I'm just trying to compare that to what it says here. So, let's just, so it comes down to the phrase, no more nonconforming. So are we no more nonconforming? We have to make sure we're comfortable with that. I'm reading on from that 1920.2 yep. one, uh, the, the second one that says the total area of the building footprint of the new or rebuilt building that extends into the required setback is no more than the total area of the building footprint of the original building that extended into the required setback. Back. Right. So I think the key word is there um, is footprint. So that's why um, go back to the patio. So if we looked at an aerial. Um, of the entire house, that patio, that the, the footprint of the house with the inclusion of that patio isn't becoming more non-conforming. So the deck is increasing by 50 square feet. However, it's still um, it's not increasing the degree of non-conformity as far as its encroachment, total area encroachment within the setback because of that patio. Because they overlap. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. So if the patio wasn't there, this would not, this wouldn't work. Yeah. Okay. We've looked at a very similar application that had no structure underneath. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like a second story deck and it didn't work because of that. But since we consider anything down to a driveway, a structure, um, that patio helps this application to be conforming. Kate, I have a question. The, on 1920.2 uh, I number three, the volume, so we, the volume is not relating to the fact that it's getting enclosed. I guess I've always struggled with the volume part because I think of that as a three-dimensional Measurement. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so I <laughs> that is a bit of a struggle because it's a math equation. Um, so I think as maybe a condition of approval that the total volume be provided. Um, but it's, but, but that it's is restricted to the volume of the new or rebuilt building located above the maximum height limit. Yeah, that's. I don't understand. That. That oh, right, above. Okay. That's <laughs> so confusing. this goes back so to the other condition of that uh, each roof pitch has a different height limitation. And so let's say, oh. you know, if something had to be 24 feet and it was 26, the total volume that was over 24 feet. Oh, okay. So that so, number three has more to do with height. Than just right. volume. Okay. Then just volume. It used to be completely volume based, and I think that's, that's a remnant. Okay. They, the, measure, remember, the, the calculation's different based on the pitch of the roof. Okay, because right. I remember some where we mm -hmm. argued about the volume. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a measurement okay. method um, so, when, when we change that. To, so as long as it's meeting the height requirements. Okay. Um, okay. The volume calculation shouldn't kick in. Okay. And at the moment, it's not non-conforming in terms of height. It's only in terms of encroachment into the yeah. setback. Well, we don't know. We don't know. does not provide the exact height. The existing structure existing, is only in terms of encroachment, but yeah. and the proposed new deck isn't any higher than the existing structure, so. Reason to say it shouldn't be a problem, but as a condition of approval, certainly you want to add in that um, okay. the, the height you provided. Yeah. If it projected above the existing structure, there would be an issue. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I think they've chosen the roof pitch. Well, either. Well, it's only extending down. Yeah. So they're they're kind of. Hemmed in by the roof pitch, by the structure rather. Okay. Well, 
people in that highest part is existing. Yeah. Yeah. If it exceeded the yeah the height of the existing structure, would be a different. Story. Okay. That was the only thing that confused me. Okay. Other comments? No. So, we, I mean, there's nobody here to speak to it, but I guess we can still, I'm assuming we can still deal with it. If, if, no. <laughs> Does anybody else have any comments? <laughs> no. All right, so then I will try and make a motion that incorporates what we've discussed. Um, I'll make a motion to finalize the record and close the record with an indication of approval. So we'll direct staff to prepare a decision indicating approval of conditional use application CU02-01R2 as depicted on the filed application materials. There will be the following conditions. A zoning permit shall be required prior to land development. The... <laughs> The, yeah, I mean, I think so. The ex so we need, I mean, height of the proposed structure should be included. Yeah, so we need the exact dimensions, including the total area, which cannot increase the degree of non conformity. We need the height of the proposed structure, which likewise must make the structure no more non conforming. And any and the structure must be generally compatible with existing materials and colours of the existing building. I'd like to make a friendly amendment as well, and, and yep. um, somewhere in there, put in the language that um, the project is built is depicted on the plans. I mean, that goes without saying, but that way it ties it to something that's in the record. <clears throat> So that, I believe, is, f well, four conditions, but did that would, so that's my motion with what I said and with um, Mark's condition. As, <laughs> like, amend, as, as amended. As amended. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. <laughs> I always forget to say it myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll move on. Okay, so item number seven on the agenda is an application is application FBZ seventeen zero one. It's an application by Civil Engineering Associates Inc. on behalf of Clint West for final plan, conditional use, and site plan review. I'm not going to read all of. The property is at 2916 Shelburne Road and is located in the Mixed Use District, Stormwater Overlay District and Shelburne Road Form Based Overlay District. And the proposal includes a two lot merger to facilitate the construction of a mixed use building containing a commercial business on the lower level and six apartment units on the second floor. Do we have anybody here to tell us about this location? Okay. Step forward, please, and raise your right hand, and please swear or affirm that the evidence that you will give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Okay, and state your name to begin with, please. Uh, my name is Clint West. Okay. So you guys um, may remember from the sketch plan review um, a few months back now, been a lot of work to get to this stage, uh, so I'm excited. Um, I was worried that Kate might not be here, but I'm glad <laughs> she's kind of here. Hi, Kate. <laughs> um, I, I've been dealing with uh, predominantly Kate on everything. Um, so what we proposed, um, 
is basically it, it's a building that uh, houses uh, commercial space on the bottom level and six apartment rentals on the upper level. It is my understanding that we are the first or close to the first to yeah. be under form-based zoning. So there's been, uh, you know, a lot of uh, checking, a lot of different things that I guess not everyone's familiar with yet. And um, I also have um, brought some uh, some handouts to address some of the concerns that were in the staff report that I tried to get everything um, cleared up that um, the staff commented on. And so I'm not sure if you guys want to go through that or I'm not sure where to go from here, but that's the general overview. I mean, I think, yeah, if you have some comments that address what's been raised in the staff report, that's a good place to start. Uh, Joanna, you'll just yep. need to make a motion to enter whatever he gives you into the record. Okay, yep. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is written materials, a um, couple of pages, and some additional plans. Yeah, everything that I have is a reflection of just some of the staff comments. Um, so I can either go through what I just gave you, or if you guys want to run through the staff comments, I can bring this stuff up as needed. We'll whatever you feels best. Um, I think it quite often works to just go through the staff report and address in order. Okay. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, yeah I don't see anywhere where there's a comment or yeah. an issue. I think mm -hmm. the ones that are checked off, we don't need to address those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> The first comment you're actually going to see that, that needs to be addressed is 1.4.7. They're building tips and forms, and it's to do with open space. At the bottom, which is what is remembered, seven, I think. Past there, so if we, if you get to the page that says zoning evaluation, go to the next page, and it starts talking about the use, the uses, and the building types. It's the seventh page. If you go back to back, so we've gone past the fire department comments. Past the fire department comments. Okay. I mean, we will need to address the fire department comments. <laughs> no, Caitlin? I'm sorry? If we're going through in order your report, then the fire department comments come first, but maybe. If you want to, uh, yeah, I mean, so you could address the fire department comments separately or just kind of go through um, all of the comments at once, which we could do before or after we kind of get into the form based requirements up to you guys. I, just, I don't know. You think it makes sense to address the form based first? I mean, I'm, I don't know. I would just start really at the matter. beginning. So, it's easier that way. 
question is, is uh, I think it's kind of nebulous like there it might be an issue and they're not really offering you know a, a solution I guess is um, it says it may be an issue um, I mean it does sound like it from that paragraph three doesn't it of the available hydrants there is um there's there's three fire hydrants that are a measurable distance yeah and there's also i just want to bring up that the, the building on top of the fire hydrants being you know depending on what you think is close or not uh it, it wasn't a requirement it was a recommendation maybe to have a fighter but this building also is fully sprinklered right so it's going to be mm -hmm. Should be pretty safe with some sprinkler system. Yep. Okay. I think maybe the only issue that relates to this, um, and maybe Clint can clarify on this as far as um, access to water, is that. Um, neighbor come in and that water line is private so it's connecting up to a private line um rick lewis is the water superintendent so they have enough capacity but um, he actually needs to be able to hook onto that line Caitlin, there's a letter in the packet from the palmer court that he, or that he just gave us from palmer court association oh, okay. which grants um Permission to use the existing water and wastewater lines. Oh, is that, is that? I read it. So. Yeah, I, I met with uh, Rick Lewis for the wastewater and Chris Robinson for the water department and clarified capacity. And I just had to get the letter because it's a private line. That private line currently already services the property that is on site. So right. we're. Department comments. And then the other comment they had was the Knox box. Oh, but um, a lot of what they said that they would work it out with the applicant. Um, so I don't know if you want to add any conditions of approval or. State requirement, anyway. So I, okay. um, I don't think we need to chime in on that. Okay. So, do we have public works department comments? Um, there was a comment that there weren't any. But I don't believe there were any in here. Is that, is that in your plan? From public yeah. works. Um, uh, yes, what is the definition of the public works? Because I've, I've met with... It's Paul Goodrich. Highway. I think that's what that refers to. Public um, works is kind of the, well, yeah. Chris, Rick, Paul. Yeah. So there's no public works right. director to go to, so, but <laughs> Paul's comments are also in here, which is to say he has no comments. Yeah, Paul, Paul was good with everything. So the comment is no comment. Yeah. Right, no comment. <laughs> okay. And, and Rick and Chris were good with it, as I see it. Yep. Can you maybe stand yeah. a little? I'm concerned that um, you need to stand a bit closer to the, the mic because our note taker is going to be listening. And, Got it. Yeah. Joanne, which section are we on now? Where are we in the comments? You can grab it. Um, yeah, he, he's probably. Over. I'll just get close. Yeah. I believe. Uh, are we on 430.1A? 430. Oh, but that's not, well, that's not really a. That's okay. Okay. Same. Well, 
No, I don't think that one's an issue. Okay. So then we do arrive at the the form-based code 1.4.7, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <coughs> the lot minimum is 5,000 square feet, and the two existing lots exceed that minimum. Therefore, we must review them. That kind of doesn't make sense to me. Like if they're yeah. okay. lot, lot standards. So if two lots come into common ownership that one or the other doesn't meet the minimum lot size requirement, they're supposed to automatically merge. But if they come into common ownership and can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um and it, um, either excuse me. <coughs> Uh, one or both of them meet the minimum lot size requirement. It's reviewed as a subdivision. There's really no issue with merging them. It's just that's how we set it up as a review. So that's why this is a final plan application because it's considered a minor subdivision. Um, but it's really just an FYI uh, more than anything else, but this is why it's being reviewed as a subdivision. But there's no issue with the lot merger as far as okay. I've researched. So do we have to classify this as a minor subdivision? You already had it sketch plan. We already did? Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. So the next comment would be the bill to zone occupancy percentages um, weren't given on the original plans. I believe Clint has updated plans. I, I have. Um, if you, um, on the slide, if, if possible, um, the picture of the front and the back of the building, it has a, a, a little table that has that information, as well as it's in the, uh, the one I just gave you guys. Um, A201. Well, actually, she doesn't have this one, right? Um, or does she? Caitlin, do you, do you? Ha I have it in a video. Okay, I can. Um, I I have it. Uh, well, you guys have it in front of you. <laughs> I have it on a board as well. If you'd like to see that. Yep. Okay. So explain to us how this addresses the comment. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. It. I gave you the wrong sheet. Okay. The, the built uh, the built to zone is on the uh, straight on the table. C one point one. Right. All right. There we go. Yeah. The the built to zone occupancy. Yeah, zoning regulations is a 70% minimum, and we have 74%, and it's depicted in this lower uh, left-hand corner. Okay, so that's C1.1. C1.1, yeah. the table it shows, it indicates that it's compliant. same sheet will address the next comment, which was open space on the lot to a degree. Uh, there's a 10% open space minimum. So, um, so mm -hmm. also on the C1.1, um, in the <coughs> lower left-hand corner, or that would be the west, uh, <coughs> southwest side of the property, there's a shading area indicating 10%. Um, we could actually do a lot more than that, but that's just to indicate that we meet the requirements. And Clint, you've identified that open space type as a, did you pick an open space type? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, 
It's not in this section, but there's an open space requirement, but there's also types. And you need to pick a type which has a definition. Is that also addressed on here? Uh, yes, it's uh, preserve. It's compliant. There's a note on there that says yeah. it's preserve. Yep, I see. Yeah, okay. So then the next comment would be on the next page. Um, this to do with the transparency percentage. Clint, is that addressed on a different sheet? Yes. So the transpar transparency percentage is on the actual picture of the building. That's the one I was confused with earlier. It's at the bottom. Yep. And it meets all requirements. Forty percent minimum on the ground floor. Okay. 20%. Yeah. Okay. Pedestrian and bike access. Um, so in the rear of the property, um, you'll see a, um, we have an outdoor bike parking. That, that is on section C1.1. Um, there's an outdoor bike rack. And then while we're talking about bikes uh, later on, it's going to address where indoor biking is as well, uh, indoor bike parking. And that is uh, um, depicted in the let – me, let me find the, the number. <laughs> Sorry, where is the bike parking being addressed? It's on it's C1.1. Um, if you look kind of like a where's wall on though. the, it would be the northwest corner of the building. There's a large tree there. Yeah. By the driveway. Okay, so it's a new, it's it's a new sheet though. It's a two, it's a two, hoops, up two position, uh, two hoop bike rack. It, it's, in the, it's in the picture you have up on the screen currently. Mm -hmm. The the indoor and is on A one hundred, but you you can't put that up on the screen, or you can, Caitlin. Uh, That's A one hundred. Yeah, that was in the in the email I sent you. So I don't know if you have that in there or not. That, that you just passed it. There you go. Are you talking about the new plans or the ones that were originally submitted? Uh, it's in it's in the new plan. I. I have it in my hand, and you have the email, so it's, you. It's on our package. Okay. What's it's that? A, it's in our package, Kate. Okay. A one hundred. A one hundred is, but it doesn't come with that bike. So you're gonna um, store bikes in the in the basement? Uh yes, yes. And I can I can pass around the A A one hundred so everyone could see. Okay. Satisfied with bike racks. Yep. Moving on. All right, so under 1.5.5, conflict between, I don't, I got a bit lost, figures, figure numbers and conflicts here. So okay. um, Clint kind of addressed this, and this is really just, this comment is more just pointing out a 
bit of a flaw with the form-based zoning. There's a conflict between two tables that um, talk about open space. So the requirement for the building type is 10% of the total area. And the requirement for the table for open space is actually the minimum is 0.25 acres. Um, so um, more just a flaw with the form-based zoning, I suppose, and just having those conflicting numbers. So Clint has met the 10% minimum. Um, but has not necessarily met the preserve total space minimum. So may want to discuss that if he needs to meet that 0.25 acre minimum or if the conflict should be read in the applicant's favor. Because one is far less than the other. So going back to your calculations. You're proposing roughly 2,000 square feet of open open space. Is that what we're talking about? Um, we just met the minimum requirement of 10%. We could certainly we could increase that, but we right. felt that that was what the regulations were asking for, and that's what we depicted. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the requirement is a quarter of an acre? It depends on the table you read. So the minimum requirement for the building type is 10%, but then it directs you to that other table, which is 1.5 feet. Okay. And that um, depicts the different open space types, and you preserve the it says 0.5 acres minimum. Well, that's a typical lot size, but it's talking about the open space. So, um, I think that could be read in the applicant's favor to say that the ten he's meeting a 10 percent minimum that's required as part of the building type. Not, my vote. My vote is that we rule and we. Let this lean towards the applicant on a discrepancy. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Because I, I think it goes against. Yeah, 10,000 square feet just sitting around there. It's, it's over 10,000 square feet. Yeah. I, mean, right. I think. Yeah. I All think. Right. Might want to point that out to Dean to yeah. take a look at yes. that. That would, that would really put the kibosh on this development. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Okay, so the next one that we need to deal with is the parking. Um, I received an email from Clint earlier. I haven't quite had a chance to read it for a parking reduction waiver. We have that yeah, in our yeah. packets. Okay. What's our ability to waive? How far can we go? Up to 50%. Okay. 50% of what? Well, that's another question in the staff report is uh, what, and, and that's addressed in 1965, 1975, um, is what, what type of building or what type of use they use to calculate the parking. That's, we want to put a hold on this until we get to the actual parking section. Okay. That might make more sense. All right. And the bicycle parking was addressed as long as you're okay with having um, the covered parking in the basement. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. More parking, more parking, landscaping. Landscaping. Mm -hmm. 1.6.3E. Oh, a 1.6.25 tandem parking. Just address that in his letter to us, I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, is that sufficiently addressed? Could we handle all the parking? 
talking stuff right now. Yeah. Let's just do it and get it done. Yeah. So what is the total required? I know it says 12 or So that kind of depends on what they used um, as as they use. So uh, residential dwellings require two spaces per unit. So that's 12 spaces required just for the residences. Um, and I use the most closely related use, which was office building or service establishment or commercial or business use which requires one space for every 300 square feet. One space for what? Say again. That is one space for every 300 square feet. Um, so it's got 5,000 square feet of the commercial business. Um, so that's about 16 spaces. So altogether, he would need 28 spaces, and I believe he has 20. That. Can you kind of explain, you know, the, your anticipated need? Because it's sure it's not really uh, like a walk-in commercial. So yeah, or it's yeah. So we're we're essentially going to be. Um, uh, I own Maple Leaf Carpet yeah. and Tile Cleaning, and yeah. we're we're going to be um, essentially cleaning rugs. Okay. So um, vehicles either leave the premise and come back at the end of the day. Or um, if a customer chooses to bring a rug to us, um, they're there for a short period of time, and then they're they're. Okay. I mean, if we were overrun with parking with rugs, I'd be I'd be psyched, but I don't anticipate <laughs> needing a bunch of parking for um, people dropping off rugs. It's probably going to be a ten minute transaction, mm -hmm. and uh, and very limited at that. So okay. we do a lot of um, just picking up of customers' homes and then returning them. So okay, um, I with the twenty spaces, I feel that I could straight face for multiple reasons. Um, a, there's a, the reduction for up to fifty percent, but I actually think like currently we only use three spots, and we have the ability to park our vehicles inside as mm -hmm. well, which would even free up more spots. Um, so if you take the 12 for the uh, rental units, which honestly, not even sure those are gonna be fully occupied. One's a studio and one's a, yeah. a one bedroom. Yeah. So, and um, even if um, there was a parking issue, I guess, um, they'll be leaving during the day and during business hours and vice versa. I, I don't yeah. anticipate any major parking Caitlin, what did you, you base your parking requirement for the, did you base it on 5,000 square feet? Yes. Okay, because I mean, you, and you used office use? I used the office and personal service establishment use. Because I, yeah, well, for the first for the floor. For the first floor. So, I mean, I, I don't think that's really accurate because a good chunk of this is, um, like garage. It's garage. Yeah. And the second of it is more, I can't really call it manufacturing, but it's, you know, like rug service, drying. And then yeah. there's basically yeah. two off, three offices in here. And how many employees? So. There's there? three total. Okay. <clears throat> so so. Uh, another, another thing in the regs, um, and you can correct me, Kate, if, if, I'm, if I'm off on this, but... It's either one parking space per thousand or one per two thousand for furniture stores, um, and I mean my use is yeah. yeah. So we have the bill. So some twenty nine. We can waive it by fifty percent, so we can take it down to fifteen. So you got twenty. It's within our yeah. ability to waive. Okay. I I would yeah. support that. And would the tandem parking be used for employees, or how do you see that? Yeah, so um, the regulation said I had to demonstrate, you know, so people don't get boxed in, so that would be the appropriate um, uses for employees, so they can hang their keys up in the shop, and if yeah. someone... Great. Yeah. We all, we're good with parking? 
Yeah. 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 Sweet. All right. Where are we at? We're at landscaping. So I, I can speak to a little bit to the landscaping. So the new uh, form based zoning requires quite a quite a few plantings. Um, so my original um, landscape plan, um, which I thought was adequate, uh, diving deeper into this, uh, it, it wasn't. So we added in the rear setback, we added um, more arborvitaes mm -hmm. and um, a more understory trees to meet. Basically, it was 40, 40 tr uh, shrubs for, per 100 linear feet. We have 165 feet in the back, so it turns out to be 66 of the uh, arborvitaes. And then four understory trees per, per 100 feet, which translated into like six point something, but we did seven trees to make sure we covered that. And... Um, everything should be adequate and that was updated on um, the plan that I gave you guys um, I, I don't have an actual updated landscaping drawing but I depicted it on L1.0 Front Street. Uh, Rhino grass. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So the landscape plan yeah. is not updated, but graphically it's on the new plan that you gave us. Is that yes. The okay. Correct. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Just right. the one that was in color I originally submitted. Um, oh. But the staff comments wasn't adequate, so I updated it. I couldn't get the land oh, uh, skip architect that. to update it that in time Did I miss for this. Ah, there it is. <laughs> so this plan you submitted tonight is your revised landscape plan. So. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. So given the lot size, it addresses it pretty well. Good with it, Jeff? I'm good. All right. <laughs> So, I think that takes us, if we're good with landscaping, Caitlin, down to 17.5, 175, item 4. It takes us to 1.6.3 about the dumpster. Did I miss one? Okay. So we'll the, to discuss the dumpster. Yes, the, the dumpster was just, just a hair over in the original plan and it was yeah. it was moved and updated in. Um, plan C one point one. Yeah, so it was in this marginally in the step back before, wasn't it? No, it's not according to that. It was in the landscaping buffer. <laughs> right? Yes, and that's been revised. Basically. Okay. Okay, um, oh. So, you don't have to 
provide a letter about the um, Palmer Court Homeowners Association and the access off of there? So I, I provided a letter for the um, access uh, for the water and the uh, wastewater um, mm -hmm. access. The there it really it, it certainly could be a condition. Um, the the property is currently accessed on the north side of the property um, as is. And it's just moving down a little bit, so I guess mm -hmm. I could get a letter if I need a letter. But it's accessed through the north side currently, and it will continue to be accessed through the north side, just relocated. I think the current location though is within um, the state, like Route Seven jurisdiction, and the new one is entering into the private road. That's... I disagree with you. I, mean, that, I think that right away down through there is not very wide. Um, I think it would be wise to get a letter. I'm talking um, how far um, how far west into Palmer Court the actual private part of Palmer Court starts. So the existing access is from what I saw in a different oh, parcel okay. location, but. So um, so you're saying yeah, and, you're saying that the the right of way is not shown on Palmer Court <clears throat> on this plot that we have, this plat on P one or is it yeah. on another drawing? It looks like it's on C one point one. The uh, the access to the north, although relocated, um, when Shelburne Road was widened, it, they used to turn directly off of Shelburne Road into yep. this property, and they relocated. Um, the access to taking Palmer or Clearwater, whatever you want to call that, um, to the side. Um, I'm happy to do whatever you want me to do or whatever you need me to get on that. So it's just a small part of the proposed new access that mm -hmm. is not in the public right of way. Is that right? Is that, what, is that the issue? Yes. Right. Just this tiny little... Right. right there. Yeah, it's tiny, but it seems like it would just be cleaner to get. Yeah. Sign yeah. off. I think. Yep. All right. It's those little things. Oh yeah. Mm. This is taking a long time. <laughs> <laughs> why is this not? Why are there so many comments here? We usually get things, and they're a lot cleaner. So we can go through. Form based. We've done a lot. Yeah. That's why. Yeah, but I, I thought form based was supposed to. Supposed to be easier. Be easier. <laughs> I think Cliff would disagree. <laughs> I, I thought there was a lot of comments, but I'm I'm here to do whatever I need to do. You're doing now. great. Yeah. Okay, so we need. Where we at? Yeah, I'm lost. Something back. Traffic. Future traffic. I, I'm, I think we're down to the pedestrian and vehicle 175. Um, okay. Minus four. I'll go with that. So, um, it talks about um, future traffic trips um, <clears throat> so is there a trigger Caitlin for a traffic study here I don't I mean 75 yes yeah, so, big hour trips right so I think it's a non-issue we're talking Done. plus or minus 13 um, yep um, I want to say just looking through these quickly that most of these are an F FYI if you care to discuss but I didn't really have a concern about traffic. It's, okay. you know, it's a single family house now and 
13 trips is a heck of a lot on Route 7. Um, no. Of course, I guess that would be a trans decision to make in the end, but um, I really think the only other substantive comments I have are in lighting. Uh, guide us to where? Sure. So it's in 1975. 1975 is where it starts. So it's a few pages sure. past where we are. Thank you. Motion sensors. So I guess I can kind of speak to this. Uh, Kate, do you have the um, uh, photos? to put up on the screen for that? Yeah. Is that what you're looking for? Um, yeah, that, that's that's one of them. Um, so basically, I consulted with uh, RAB Lighting. Um, I gave them, um, that, that, that's what they do. You give them their regs and they, they, they figure it out. And, um, and so these are designed to be full cutoff shield lights they call them so they're not to um you know cast into the I'm really concerned about the neighbors and then you know of course driving down shelburne road so they're all downward facing lights um i'm proposing to have those on 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 dimmers um if need be but ultimately they're on for you know safety and security and um i would I'll be happy to do timers or whatever, but I, I feel like leaving these on um, will have minimal impact. And um, Kate, can you pull up the other, uh, the one with the numbers on it as well? This is the uh, the kind of the impact zone. They There is something in here that says I don't meet the requirements and I'm, you yeah, know. Uh, if you go to 756B, mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, well, I lost it, uh, 756C, so we don't have that illumination data, so it's kind of hard to, yeah. Caitlin, what did you base that comment on? In you should have that. 1975.6C? Yeah. Okay, and which, which part of it, the maximum, maximum average yes. elimination? Yeah, you say it's 3.16. Right, so our lighting table says the maximum average elimination is one foot candle, and this is 3.16, according to the chart that I have okay. up on the screen. I've got no shot at seeing that, so. <laughs> uh, so there's just a few spots where it's, I, I mean, I think it's being triggered just by a few spots where it's just ultra, ultra bright. Generally, there's not an issue with, you know, light pollution um, into neighboring properties, but there's a few, I'll go back to. Right. So, right. It, yeah, it is, but it's that's what's triggering that average illumination being greater than the allowance. I don't see how that could be correct, though, because so much of the site has zero. Is there a table? Did they give us a table for average illumination? Am I missing? Yeah. No, okay. There's a there calculation is. summary table. Yeah. No, I guess I could. There's that. But that's in a specific area. That's down there. How do you calculate average? I have no idea. You got some. And add it all up. And then divide by the number. Thank you. Right. <laughs> but you asked. I did. See, if you take, I huh. believe if you take what they call stat area one, which I think that encompasses 
the area right oh, around the building. Okay. I see. So okay. There's a boundary. Right there's a there. boundary. There's okay. like an area of interest in that yeah. number. So. And yeah. So it's it's like that area. Yeah. And three foot candles is a pretty low number. Hmm? So. I'm just wondering why, when you calculate the averages, I believe, Caitlin, you, if they're looking at the averages throughout the entire lot, you'd have to take the 0 .42 and the 3.16 and average, and average that. So I'm just, I was using that number based on the calculation summary table that's in the back of the packet. So I had assumed that they took all those um, different areas into account. So that half of the, the max illumination on the is something like 10 point, 10 point six foot candles and the minimum is obviously zero. So, um, I mean, we just want to get a clarification that yeah, I think either that's incorrect or we can bring it back down to that just by maybe eliminating some of the lights or turning them down a little bit. It seems like the, I'm assuming the, the um, tenant parking would be the very furthest back possibly, or do you know which spaces might be? I am, um, I'm don't, I'm up open to recommendations. I didn't want to put any, you know, 20 foot high lights because no. there's the neighbor. Oh, so I thought, I thought but, having the downcast lights, but at least. Yeah, I'm just concerned about the, where the residents are parking back toward the west edge. You might need kind of a low pole light there mm -hmm. just because they're in complete darkness according to the. Well, what we could do if, if, if this is acceptable um, is that could be employee parking and then the tandem parking there's two spaces allowed per unit so we could say you can double yeah. stack because it's your unit and that's your responsibility to get in and out and that is lit over there as well yeah um, i would just want to make sure that where people are getting in and out of their cars has light i don't think you yeah. have enough light i don't either, <laughs> okay. I, don't either. I, I would i would recommend a pole light with a house side shield so it doesn't shine okay. into the neighbors, you know, for that back parking area. Yeah. Uh, sure. Let's and make it, sure all the parking spots are covered for safety. Yeah. I yep. mean, it can be like a 12 or 14 foot you know, kind of fixture. Sure. So. Okay. I agree with Mark. I think, you know, you've got a fair amount of, part of light at the entrances, but the rest of the area is pretty dark. Yeah. Yep. It's it's pretty hard to see the background. We got the dumpster kind of points yep. out where the dumpsters are. So yep. you can see the plantings there, but I So just picture like someone getting out at twelve at night, it's dark, they're getting out of their car, you want to make sure they're right. illuminated yep. and it's safe. Okay. I mean this I'm not concerned about Shelburne Road because I think there's a a street light there, which there, probably right, isn't accounted for on here, but the, I think the, 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 rear the dark part, corner right there, yeah. that's where there's a street light. It's yeah. just not depicted. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just concerned about the where tenants would be parking and right. So you got parking spot one. So just just come back to us or I'm gonna make a suggestion to you that I'm gonna um that you you can send this to a lighting supplier or there are people that do this for a living. Um, your, well, Rab ought to be able to you, do it. They it? can, but your your consulting engineer has a, <laughs> a a really good resource for lighting design or some. I'm not telling you who, but I would go to a, a qualified lighting designer and have them do a plan for the whole site, not just the building. Okay. And just make sure that it it complies with the Shelburne Town Ordinance. Yeah. And um, um, they could. They could model this thing so it's compliant. I'm not really concerned about the hot spots around the building because yeah, I Great. think you have to take those two numbers in the table and combine them, and that's your average. Mm -hmm. And you don't have any hot spots that are anywhere escaping off the property right now. So, and th three foot candles or four foot candles at the at the building envelope is pretty small. Yeah. So, 
I would not, I will I'd be glad to make that a condition of approval sure to move it makes along. sense okay So I'm going to I'm going to suggest to the board that um, we make a condition that he come back to us with a plan by a qualified lighting designer that that um, complies with the, the zoning the, or the lighting requirements in this form based code district. And I think they would be able to take care of a lot of these issues. OK. All right. Mark, did you want that as a condition, or, or you would just continue? Well, I think, I think well. I, I was, I was just looking lights. for conditions. Yeah, yeah I but I see lights across the entire site that comply to the ordinance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. then I'm thinking maybe we need to continue because I also made a note that we would like that letter from the Palmer Court as Association. So I don't know if we should see that before we make our final decision. Mm -hmm as well and then another note that i made was there are no comments from vtrans but i didn't know if the board thought that was significant enough to why that it was just that was a comment. it was a comment no, yeah. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm good okay, okay. um anything on the we're okay no, with the parking spots as de spaces as depicted in the diagram Okay. okay. Did we need anything specific about the landscaping? No. I don't. I don't think so. The fur tour. A resident. So just those <laughs> two then. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you've done a great job of addressing a lot of things, <laughs> and yeah. you know, being the first to kind of go through it. Okay. So then. Caitlin, if I move to continue, it needs to be to a specific date, and so that will be the April eighteenth meeting. That is a light agenda at this point. Okay, and does that give you enough time? That because we need those two things that we just mentioned, the lighting I mean, plan. I'm going to get right on it. I would imagine, but okay. yeah, it's only two weeks. Yep. Um, right. Does it just have to be in by? that night or a week Kate, before? when would the materials be due? A week prior to the meeting. So it just gives you a week, actually. So it's not a lot of time. So the next meeting after that would be May 2nd. Does that make more sense? Can, so can we shoot for the 18th? And is there, if I'm not prepared, go to the next one? Or, or is that? I think so. Yeah. OK. Great. Okay, so then um, if there are no other comments and nobody else in the audience has any comments. Can I just ask a question unrelated yes, to sorry. all of it? Just looking at the size of the apartment units, um, they seem really small for what they are, for two bedrooms and so forth. I don't know if there was any thought given to, you know, the number of units versus the size of the units sure um, and how they compare to other um, apartment units in Shelburne so they are on the smaller side um, it, uh, from looking around the area and talking to architects um, it, it's actually kind of common there's much bigger ones obviously as well but um, the decision was made to go with this size um, for partially financial reasons um, as well um, for what they will generate to help basically me build the building and being able to do this project. Um, that was part of the consideration, but it's also very, um, very common, although I know they're on the smaller end in general. Okay. So, I was just curious. Yep. I'm working on a micro apartment building. <laughs> they're going to be like 350 square feet. So, so these are big. <laughs> <laughs> I can personally attest that this is a normal size for Chittenden County. You know, sidebar, we do a lot of apartments, and I'm surprised there's 
way more two bedroom units than I would expect. Yeah. I mean, I, I say it having moved here from a two bedroom apartment that was 1,150 square feet. So I'm looking at yeah. 700, which was comparable to a one bedroom. That's, that's yeah. all. I was yeah. just curious. The studios rent and one bedrooms rent faster than the, the twos. What do we have? Okay. We'd have so, a lot of. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to make a, a motion to continue application <coughs> FBZ 17 01 to our April 18th, 2018 meeting. And what we would like from the applicant is uh, a letter from the Palmer Court Homeowners Association addressing the question of the right of way and your right to use it, I guess. And I don't know what, a detailed lighting plan? I mean, how should that be phrased? I guess say, Mike, uh, uh, Mark mentioned lighting it earlier. Lighting plan for the entire site that meets the zoning lighting requirements. Okay. Uh, <laughs> as stated by Jeff. Second. Who was that that seconded, sorry? Mark seconded. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take a deep breath. Actually, um, what I forgot to do, I don't know if we have to backpedal or not, was to specifically address the materials that were handed to us, which are now, I was um, supposed to make a motion to bring those into the record. record. That's. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Joanna, so you could just label each of them as an exhibit. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's descending into chaos. <laughs> okay. So we will turn to item eight on the agenda, which is application SP 18 02, which was continued from our previous meeting. And this is the application by Civil Engineering Associates on behalf of RAN Vermont Investments seeking site plan review. The proposal includes the reconfiguration of an existing parking lot and changes to circulation. The property at 5531 Spear Street is located in the rural district, the stormwater overlay district, and the floodplain and watercourse overlay district. Here. If you didn't bring, if you, it wasn't in our. Okay, this is, okay, this is SP 18-02, yes, which we should all have sure. materials yeah. for from last time. Mm -hmm. um, and who is here to speak to this application, please? On behalf of the applicant, I'm Dave Marshall from Civil Engineering Associates. Uh, we also have Jim Jernander, the superintendent of the golf course, and John Paul, uh, golf course operations. Uh, okay. here on behalf of the applicant also. Okay. So anybody who's going to testify, if you could please raise your right hands and please swear or affirm that the evidence that you're about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. I do. Thank you. All right. Who will start? Uh, I would be happy to do that. Um, okay. In this particular case, this is... Um, the, this is associated with the existing uh, clubhouse area and the parking lot that operates generally the very western edge of the 93 acre parcel. And this particular plan has just rotated 90 degrees, so north is to the right on this particular plan. And this is Spear Street at the very top of the drawing. Uh, this represents the existing clubhouse area. There are currently two curb cuts coming off of Spear Street where we have one which we call the north curb cut and one which is the south curb cut. Uh, under today's conditions, there uh, you basically drive in and work your way around. Um, and there's two handicapped parking spaces right here that are on a kind of a 
steep side slope and not ideal. Uh, under existing conditions, there is a 500 gallon gasoline storage uh, tank at this particular location, as well as a enclosed dumpster. Um, and as far as other points of interest, uh, I think that generally covers uh, at least the existing conditions. And now, Kate, if we can go to the proposed conditions. Here we go. Uh, a little bit busier. Um, uh, but nonetheless, if you want to zoom in, Kate, that's an option to basically see the area a little bit better. Um, what we are looking at doing primarily is trying to bring the site into a more compliant approach as far as the the accessible parking spaces. So right now, um, I'll let this calm down a little bit. There we go. So these uh, original two uh, parking spaces, which we talked about being on a steeper slide slope, are being relocated out to this particular location. This allows for a fully ADA compliant access from this particular portion of the property into the clubhouse or at least to the face of the clubhouse at the same time we're also looking to basically augment the number of parking spaces that currently are on the property currently only two uh, when five are required and we're looking at basically providing those three remaining parking spaces uh, at this location now the other component of the project which basically is looking to actually update and try to improve the current circulation that occurs on the westerly side of the existing building currently uh, golf cart operations or management is is um, accommodated or basically dealt with right on this particular area and it also becomes a very busy area with regard to pedestrians and golf carts and everything that's basically running all through this area what the new owners of the golf course would like to do is basically bring those operations down into the side to basically uh, improve circulation in this particular area and basically provide a, a, you know, a, a good surface with plenty of area to deal with not only uh, queuing, or I'm sorry, well, we'll call it queuing for uh, golf, course, golf cart usage to basically uh, get them tied into the golfers looking to utilize them for their rounds of golf but it's also a drop-off area so we're looking to try to organize that whole management component of the of the clubhouse facilities in an area on the south side now in this particular case things that we want to do to basically create a separation between these golf course golf cart storage area and the remaining vehicular circulation pattern is to basically create some new islands so we're not creating any new any net increase in impervious area but we are proposing to cut out asphalt and basically put in some new grass islands at these particular locations to basically again create both visual and physical separation between this particular area and as people come in and through the parking area to again try to create a safer situation there um, things that we are doing with regard to the existing uh, gas storage tank is we're looking at basically just abandoning its use on this particular property. Uh, off this particular plan, but within the application package, is a site plan for the maintenance building. So way up in the corner of the room here uh, is actually a plan or at least where the location of the existing maintenance facility is so if uh, in your mind's eye you can imagine the intersection of webster road and spear street and in the southwest quadrant there there's a big barn oh nope that's not quite it oh, we're getting closer though um anyways currently at that location there is already a 500 gallon storage tank for gas and they're looking at basically just trying to um you know, consolidate operations and rather than having two tanks they want to go with one uh, at the same time the dumpster that is currently at this particular location is also proposed to be relocated down at the particular maintenance facility and you would think because of the proximity of the distance between them that you know that might be a problem well there are actually a lot of uh, employees and golf carts running between the two buildings on a regular basis so it wouldn't represent any new um, change in operations that, from what currently occurs today uh, but we're looking to basically clean up this area pretty significantly in regards to again what people experience and, and what some of the operations components uh, include so that's a lot of talking um, maybe at this point in time we can uh, briefly go through some of the staff comments 
Um, one of them was concerning Article 5, where the, it indicates that the applicant has not indicated whether or not it's eligible or is required to deal with stormwater. Um, what, interestingly, staff comments a little bit further down the page say is that we're actually reducing impervious and it by, through the introduction of the islands. So I think by default, we basically have answered the question that we have, we're not increasing impervious area and therefore are not subject to Article 5 in regards to dealing with stormwater management. Article 5 basically talks about whenever you increase the impervious area by 10,000 square feet, then you are obligated to meet those particular standards. Uh, in this particular case, we're actually reducing impervious area. So by default, we feel comfortable that there's a non-issue with that in that regard. Um, I'm going to just quickly take a look at uh, anything else. I think uh, with regard to, there's a questions at the very end with regard to landscaping, uh, whether this is going to be subject to uh, those particular standards. So that'll be one question that we can come back to. Uh, in the same area, it also talks about um, the need for, excuse me, um, potential access or potential easements along the roadway. So one of the obligations of the zoning bylaw is to look into whether or not um, there's opportunities to improve bicycle or shared use paths along specific corridors. Um, currently under today's conditions, there is a four foot wide, uh, it's not a formal bike lane, but definitely it was a widened shoulder that was put in by Public Works probably, uh, I'm gonna guess eight or nine years ago now. And um, at this point in time, there's still another 15 feet of available rights of way between the 66 foot wide or four rod wa road, excuse me, four rod wide roadway of Spear Street at this particular location for other facilities. There are some challenges obviously with any of these locations as far as the topography and rock outcrops. Uh, the challenges for this particular facility having been here since 1965 is that the way the parking lot layout uh, was situated is that some of it goes right up to the property line and and any type of further takings as far as a 10 foot or 15 foot or 20 foot wide uh, easement would obviously eliminate all of those particular parking spaces and at the same time this is a grandfathered activity that um, that we worked with public works and and spent some uh, some capital in relocating retaining wall to basically allow all these parking spaces to get moved further away from the travel way of Spear Street and to basically facilitate the construction of the um, the widened shoulder. So again, the applicant basically is saying, gee, we, we think that would obviously be a pretty significant impact or hardship on, on you know, just the way that this has been grandfathered and operated for a long period of time. So um, that being the background, the applicant's position or at least request is that uh, that particular type of imposition uh, not be imposed in this particular location with the understanding that um, these particular improvements are already in place. anything specific draw your attention to um no i think they covered everything okay i mean all right so you don't have any issues essentially with this part no, um, it's it's not an expansion. Well, this application oh. is not an expansion of the use. It's just a reconfiguration of the parking lot. So, uh, no, I don't have any comments for this particular application. Okay. Any members of the board have questions or comments? I have a concern about the removal of the dumpster mm -hmm. and relocating it um, down to the maintenance facility. I know you mentioned that there are plenty of employees going back and forth um, regularly, which I don't disagree with, but are they, they're not typically hauling trash back and forth along Spear Street. It's almost a quarter of a mile. Um, it just seems like not an ideal situation um, or 
Uh, so in this particular case, uh, as far as trash removal from the building, that's done once a day? Yes, it is. Okay, th that was Jim Jernander <laughs> speaking uh, in regards to that. And as far as, again, if you can, Jim, speak perhaps a little bit about, again, what your experiences are. Uh, so as far as trash... I was, I was morning, yeah. Um, so as far as trash removal goes, the current procedure is we actually drive around the entire golf course um, where there's trash at every single hole. Um, and that's all picked up. Um, and then we pick up the trash that's at the clubhouse. Um, we actually put the trash into the dumpster there and we pick up all the recycling uh, materials that are at the clubhouse. And that goes down to the maintenance facility for storage and sorting. Um, so it's basically just adding that trash component along with it. Um, so we would just be bringing the recycling as well as the trash. And so it would just be once a day? That is the plan, yes. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? Questions? No? Okay. Anybody want to make a motion since I've been doing everything? Um, I would first make a motion to finalize the record for application <clears throat> SP 18-02. Uh, I would also make a motion to approve and close the hearing and direct staff to prepare a decision to indicate approval of site plan application SP 18-02 as depicted on the application materials uh, received and dated February 23rd, 18. With two condition, uh, one condition that a zoning permit shall be required prior to any improvements being made. I will second that motion. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carried. Okay, we'll move on to item number nine on the agenda. This is applications SP18-03 and CU18-01, also continued from our previous meeting. This is an application by Civil Engineering Associates on behalf of Rand Vermont Investments, seeking site plan and conditional use review. <coughs> so this proposal includes reconfiguration and expansion of an existing golf course, as well as modification and expansion of parking, landscaping, and other site alterations. The property is at 5531 Spear Street and is located in the Rural District, the Stormwater Overlay District, and the Floodplain and Watercourse Overlay Districts. And who is here to address this application? Uh, I'm Dave Marshall from Civil Engineering Associates. Okay. Very good. Um, this particular application is a continuance of uh, the one that appeared before the board. There were some issues as far as notification to one of the neighbors. At the same time, we had also introduced new design plans to reflect some changes in this particular area of the golf course. Um, in the meantime, we've been working with um, the Beaver Creek neighborhood as far as issues associated with the proposed use of the forested area in the northeast quadrant. Um, we are still working with them and we would like to get some additional time to work with that particular group before we present the final plans to the board. So uh, this is a late notice, uh, but nonetheless, um, we would like to seek a continuance uh, before the board. Being the late hour, I guess that's at least the good news. Uh, the bad news is we kick the can down the road a little bit further. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we are looking to basically move quickly as far as trying to find a solution. Uh, it didn't happen as soon as this afternoon, but out of all that, uh, we're looking to at least buy some time and, uh, and be able to provide new plans to the board uh, if necessary. So that being the background, um, I guess uh, we're interested in what the board's thoughts are with regard to granting a continuance. Uh, for this application. Okay. Sorry, just clarify why, 
you're discussing with who are you discussing with? Uh, we may provide we may redesign the a portion of the golf course. Okay. Based on your discussions with the Beaver Creek. That's correct. Discussions with who? Beaver Creek, the neighborhood that's oh, yeah. right there. Oh, I'm sorry. To introduce you, this is the the Beaver Creek neighborhood here, and this is actually called Beaver Creek road I believe yeah. but to orient you again this is Spear Street and this is Webster Road here and the the dark hatching represents the existing golf holes and these are the six golf holes that are ultimately being eliminated as part of a conversion into a residential neighborhood and what the golf course is looking to do is is infill some of the unused areas within the existing footprint but the application at this point also includes some uh, two proposed golf holes in the far northeast corner outside of the wetland uh, areas that are, have been mapped in, in that particular portion of the property. This particular plan happens to show the, uh, whether it be the uh, class two wetlands and the 50 foot buffer associated with them or both class two wetlands and then um, a 50 foot stream buffer corridor. Uh, so basically, from a stream or riparian corridor uh, components, the green and the brown represent uh, those particular areas that we're working with the state of Vermont on. Uh, we had a very good meeting recently with them concerning uh, both sections, but nonetheless, uh, we're still working on the concepts as far as layout on this particular part of the golf course uh, with um, the property owners uh, to the south. Okay, and so you may redesign completely. You may read based on uh, those discussions. It's so. hard for me to tell you just right. how extensive it would be. Okay. We hope it would be minor, but nonetheless, it's it, we're not in a position to um, move forward without wasting your time having to perhaps review something different. Okay. Is there anybody else in the audience who's here to offer comments on this application? No? Nope. Yes? Okay. Um, Hi. Oh, I should be sworn in, right? So, yeah, I probably should, even though it's just, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, you need to please swear or affirm that the evidence that you're going to give to us shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Thank you. So um, just identify yourself. My name is Candace Pinar. Um, my husband, Nat Lester Cole, is also in the audience. We reside at 579 Beaver Creek Road. We could not be present for the last meeting um, at which this application was discussed. Um, we're here. We were the neighbors who um, weren't notified. There was, uh, we recently moved into the neighborhood in July, and so we think that the notification was sent to the previous owners of the house. Um, I just wanted to go on, I'm sorry, I mean, go ahead. Probably what we're interested in is your thoughts on uh, what Dave just said, which is that given the discussions that I gather Beaver Creek residents are in with the applicant, what's your comment on his request to postpone? So that was actually my, my question. Um, so we are Beaver Creek residents, however, we haven't been included in these discussions. And so um, I did I just wanted it to be on the record, I guess, and to ask you as the as the board how these sorts of um, discussions typically are arranged between private residences and um, applicants. Um, okay. So I just uh, I just wanted to to mention that we weren't uh, advised or uh, yeah, we weren't included in these discussions, even though we're current residents. Right. I mean, I, I don't know whether other board members have more insight in that than I do. But. I think that's really, um, based on my past experience, it's really not our purview to okay. get involved in negotiations between an applicant and adjacent property owners. I mean, normally um, they would be notified. <coughs> yeah, and that's... Um, yeah. Yeah, normal. Well, no, they're notified by the applicant. By the applicant. Um, they have to provide the envelopes and the postage and the notices, and it happens. Mm -hmm. you, property transfers, and but as far as participating, we don't really sanction those discussions between applicants and other, uh, outside of the hearings. Right. Other than to encourage, obviously. We do yeah. encourage it, yes. Um, but that's really. And nice. I mean, I guess you know, you have some people here today. Maybe it would be worth. Just raising that with them. Okay. Maybe you can make sure that you are involved going forward. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, but essentially, though, because you, you've made the effort to be here, but you don't object to us granting a, the request to continue? Or? No, no, I don't. Okay. Uh, any any thoughts from the board on continuing or I, seems to make I sense. would move to continue yeah. it to um, the next available um, time on the agenda to address an application with this si sizable application <laughs> day you, you think next meeting or how's our agenda look Kate? That's the goal. Um, we yes, secondary issues as far as Thank you. I'm sorry uh, that is the goal um, I think we would need to, we would allow staff to understand by the middle of next week, well, we'd have to get any new application materials in by the middle of the next week. That's the standard. Uh, if we didn't, then we would be back to ask one more continuance. I hate to do that to you, but at the same time, everybody's fighting construction schedules and the ability to basically get things on the ground done and starting to grow in. So uh, we're... We're, we're being tugged in and pushed and pulled, but nonetheless, uh, at the risk of asking for that particular favor of the, the board, um, if there is, that would be an ideal situation in order to be able to be set up for the next hearing. Okay, I think that's April 18th, is that? Mm -hmm. yep. There's two items on that agenda, not counting Clint's application. One is for race lumber with the landscaping revision, and the other is for um, uh, access. So they're not big applications and it's just wrapping up clips. So. Okay, so then I will second Mark's motion to continue this application to our next meeting, which is April 18th. Any discussion? All those in favor? I think I seconded Mark's motion. Third. Yeah, third. Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there any other business or correspondence that the board needs to deal with? No? 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 Okay. Then I will make a motion to close the meeting. Thank you. All those in Aye. favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you.